Dynasty Warriors 7 takes place in a semi-mythologized version of ancient China, one where women are treated equal to men, and men are treated equal to gods. If you're not familiar with the time period, it might take a bit of getting used to. The source material has almost a thousand named characters. Don't be put off by the seven in the title. This isn't a continuation of any particular plot. Every game in the series is set during the same time period with the same main characters. Think of Dynasty Warriors more like you would with FIFA. There might be some improvements or, uh, other features, but it will always be the same game after every installment. The game is set during the Three Kingdoms period in 2nd and 3rd century China, as recorded in the records of the Three Kingdoms by Chen Shou, as annotated by historian Pei Song Zhu during the 5th century, as reinterpreted in the 14th century Romance of the Three Kingdoms by Luo Guanzhong, as adapted by a 21st century Japanese video game developer. If that sounds complicated, it is. The big one there is the Romance of the Three Kingdoms novel. It's probably the most famous Chinese literature work of all time. Its influence in China is equivalent to all of Shakespeare's works combined. That said, don't expect any historical accuracy here. In Dynasty Warriors, the rule of cool triumphs over all. The source material is so famous that it overshadows the real historical events that it's based upon. Figures with noble intentions were made villainous, and less than noble people were made into paragons of virtue. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Liu Bei. This might all sound overwhelming, but while at first you'll say Xiao Dun, Xiao Yun, more like shut your mouth, the next you'll be all Can anybody provide me with a decent challenge? The Dynasty Warriors series targets two very specific groups of people. People who love the Three Kingdoms period, and people who hate themselves. And you'll see why very soon. Dynasty Warriors 7 is what's commonly referred to as a Musou game. Musou games are probably best described as Omega Force and Koei Tecmo's own brand of hack and slash games. There are dozens of these games, and they're pretty much all the same thing. You'll play as an immensely powerful character cutting their way through weak soldiers and powerful captains until the victory conditions are met. Whether that's capturing a certain point, escorting an ally, defeating a certain enemy character, or... Actually, I think that's it. That's all you do! No matter the platform, I recommend using a gamepad to play this. It's a typical fighting game layout, nothing special here. If you insist on using a mouse and keyboard to play, because you're an alien, then throw your mouse out the window right now, you won't be needing it. And that's not an elitist Dynasty Warriors pro tip. There is absolutely no mouse support at all, not even in menus. So avoid whatever this is, and use a gamepad if you have one. The Dynasty Warriors series is the antithesis to Tak Fuji's E3 2010 speech. If you just uh, you know, continue to press the, the same button like X, 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 and Y, 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 and X, X, and Y, Y, Y again, you'll be sucked. You have at your disposal a quick attack, a heavy attack, and once your Musou meter charges, you can unleash your Musou attack. Your combos are just different variations of the quick and heavy attacks, and eventually you'll work out the best combo for each character and never do anything else. There's no complexity to these attacks either. You can't hold down a heavy strike to charge it up for a more powerful attack or anything like that. You just tap the buttons in the correct sequence. As you defeat enemy captains or hit certain murder milestones, enemies start dropping items. These range from new weapons that your character can equip, Muso bar recharges, temporary buffs to speed or strength, or health pickups in the form of Chinese Baozi. What is in these Baozi, which make them so potent in the ways of healing? Well, with my intimate knowledge of Chinese culture and medicine, I can tell you they contain either hot water or the soul of the great salamander. Although there's over 60 characters to choose from, all move sets are connected to the weapon you've equipped, therefore making every character equipped with a sword and shield fight almost exactly the same. But there are also over 50 weapon types, so there's quite a healthy variety to keep you entertained. Apparently every character has different proficiencies with each weapon type, so go wild and make Dian Wei, this monster of a man, decimate his enemies with the harp. One thing that's unique to each character, however, is their Musou attack. This can be used after you've filled up your special bar by giving and receiving damage. Functionally, they range from radial attacks, to aerial attacks, to freezing a group of enemies or just grabbing one poor guy and banishing him to the Shadow Realm. Be gone. Visually, some are very conventional, like Xiao Hou Dun's rapid sword strikes, and some are... less so? They're usually only worth using on enemy captains. It's almost a waste to use on regular enemies. So let's explore them, shall we? As the main appeal of these Musou games is to live out the 1 vs 1000 fantasy, you can expect the regular enemies to be pretty weak, while the enemy captains are there to provide the real challenge. But how weak are the common soldiers exactly? This is the game at normal difficulty. Pretty useless, right? But this is the game at the hardest difficulty level. Jesus Christ. 
Look at that! Jesus Christ! Let's go into the difficulty settings. First of all, if you've ever played a video game, watch someone else play a video game, or read from a newspaper that video games exist, don't choose anything below normal difficulty. And unless you're held at gunpoint, don't choose nightmare difficulty. I've watched people on YouTube complete missions on Nightmare Difficulty, and not only did the mission itself take forever thanks to the massive enemy health bars, but the amount of grinding required to max out your gear and abilities to get to that level is immense. So that leaves three viable difficulty levels for normal people like me. Normal, Hard, and Chaos. On Normal, you'll probably breeze through most levels without much challenge, especially if you pay attention to upgrading your skills and weapons. You should be able to take on multiple captains at once at Normal, Hard mode is a pretty huge undertaking. The common enemies do a lot more damage, archers will be constantly chipping away at your health, and the enemy captains will be a lot more aggressive and use their musou abilities more often. Getting caught by a musou attack is pretty much instant death at this level, and fighting more than one captain at a time is a huge risk that isn't likely to pay off. Then, there's chaos mode. Just don't. It's not nearly as bad as nightmare difficulty. Unless you have the patience to max out your gear and character, I don't recommend it. Now you may have noticed something odd about the weapons these characters are using. See Xiao Dun using a tennis racket to slay his enemies? That tennis racket isn't a harmless joke weapon. That footage was from the first mission I played, where I accidentally switched to it in the middle of battle while testing the controls, and it turns out that the tennis racket was way more powerful than my starting sword. Playing the rest of the mission with a tennis racket was a breeze. That happened because I'm playing the Dynasty Warriors 7 Extreme Legends Definitive Edition, which includes all the DLC. However, for whatever reason, they just decided to lazily place all of these weapons into your inventory, even having them equipped by default. Did I mention that they are all several times more powerful than the default base weapons? So now you have the ability to trivialize all aspects of the combat by beating enemies with a tennis racket, wine bottles, hockey stick, and even a big leak. The leak ended up being my favorite weapon, and were it a real historical weapon, could have brought an early end to the Three Kingdoms period. The obvious answer to the statement, these DLC weapons are ruining the challenge, is of course, not to use them. And I tried. Believe me, I tried. But when you're faced with the prospect of mindlessly cutting through enemies for 20 minutes per mission, or 5 minutes per mission, the temptation is far too powerful. For the most part, drawing out the conflicts do nothing to improve the game. For those only vaguely familiar with the franchise, a few things might spring to mind. The repetitive nature of the combat, the terrible draw distance, and the repetitive nature of the combat. These points need to be addressed. First of all, it's a hack and slash, the most basic kind. If you prefer games that contain a lot of depth, you'll be disappointed. I played through most of the story mode using the exact same combos from start to finish. Higher difficulty levels require more attention to guard breaks, musou management, crowd control, and the proper use of elemental damage but you'll still be favouring one or two moves throughout. The game simply does not incentivize switching things up in combat. Then, there's the draw distance. I've always laughed at how bad the series has been in regards to the draw distance, and in particular, enemy pop-up. Sometimes you'll be running through an empty field only to realise that the field isn't as empty as you thought it was. It's just embarrassing at this point, and unfortunately, we just have to get used to it. I've talked a lot about the gameplay, but let's be real here. I didn't come here for the gameplay. Story mode is played out across four separate campaigns, representing the four major factions of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Each faction has the same goal, to unite China. But it's their ideology and methods which differ from one another. There's Wei, led by Cao Cao, the ambitious and ruthless warlord usually represented as the villain and sometimes anti-hero in most Three Kingdoms media. He's the pragmatic, the ends justify the means type character. Then there's Shu, led by Liu Bei, the paragon of virtue. He is the luckiest of all the historical figures included in the romance, as he is always a benevolent hero of the story. Despite being a serial wife abandoner, a poor decision maker, and an opportunistic traitor who quite possibly died from the crushing depression associated with being such a loser. Then there's Wu, led by Sun Quan, who gained most of his territory and goodwill through the efforts of his father and brother. And despite becoming, at one point, the largest of the Three Kingdoms, is often overlooked in favour of Wei and Shu. The Three Kingdoms of Wei, Wu, and Shu are what the novel is named after, and until this entry, all games in the series focus purely on them. Finally, we have Jin, led by the Summa clan. Before Seven, Dynasty Warriors games would always end before the formation of Jin. For that reason, I'd recommend playing the other faction stories first, as they mostly occur simultaneously whilst the Jin story takes place at the conclusion of their campaigns. It is time. Lost in thought, General. 
I was thinking about how it used to be just me doing and our Lord. The way Wu and Shu stories all play out with their own unique historical events, while also intersecting and pushing against each other in memorable ways. We have the Yellow Turban Rebellion, the Coalition Against Dong Zhuo, and the Battle of Chiribi. In my opinion, the story is only interesting up until the official formation of the Three Kingdoms. After that it's all just sort of a muddled mess of constant infighting, and unfortunately, that's the period in which the Jin campaign is set. The Jin faction was kind of uncharted territory for the developers, and that's reflected in the story structure and the character design. The characters in the Romance of the Three Kingdoms are the highlight of the novel, and for the most part, Dynasty Warriors does them justice. In the source material, they're all larger than life heroes with the ability to influence the outcome of huge battles and political schemes alike. And in reality, they probably all look something like this. Only a few have well-known or classic appearances, such as Zhang Fei. So to differentiate them from one another, Omega Force drew from their unique personalities and backgrounds to create their looks. Meaning that Dong Zhuo, the tyrannical, debauched leader holding the Emperor as a political prisoner, looks like this. And Gan Ning, the former pirate turned Wu general, looks like this. With the exception of a few, most characters from the Wei, Wu and Shu factions are interpreted in a believable way. Believable for a video game I mean. So let's return to the Jin faction. The other factions have been pretty much settled on with regards to their character designs through years of iteration. Of course, creating a brand new faction with several brand new characters would be quite an undertaking. But come on. And then there's the weapons. Dynasty Warriors has never adhered to realism in the past and never will. There are many characters who wield weapons that some may call anachronistic. By that I mean, why is Sima Shu using a rapier in 3rd century China? It's weird, but your mind can accept that because swords were definitely a thing in those times. Most of the main characters have weapons within the realm of believability. Except for strategists, they straight up just use sorcery. So what unique weapons do we have in the Jin faction? Big Drill. Magic Swords. Gun. What I'm trying to say is, I don't like the Jin faction at all, but props to Omega Force for including them. Each story campaign is structured as cutscene, battle, cutscene, debrief, repeat. I call it a debrief, but it's basically just exposition that explains the result of the last battle and fills in the parts that aren't about fighting. They're pretty dull and gloss over a lot of the more interesting stories outside of warfare. They do an okay job of contextualizing the battles, nothing more. But what they do really well are the cutscenes. If you are wondering why I chose to review number 7 of all games, it's because of the fantastic presentation, with the cutscenes being a major highlight for me. Gameplay has always been pretty much the same with minor improvements as the series has grown, but number 7 is where they got things so right with the presentation of the story. Each mission focuses on a different character, letting you play through the majority of the roster. Some characters get more attention than others, some only show up for one mission, some only get half a mission. I quickly grew to like most of the characters in a short amount of time. They are just as over the top as the gameplay, with excellent over the top voice acting to complement it. The horn has already burned out. Fools who would defy heaven's will feel its fiery fury. What a hothead. They make everything bearable. I can't speak for the whole fan base. But I play this brainless, unimaginative and lazy series of the story. It's the same story they've been telling for two decades, but trust me, they're finally starting to get good at it. Storytelling aside, the actual gameplay is as basic as it comes. Though the story can hype you up to really want to fight your way to the enemy commander, mechanically it'll play out almost the same way, with very little to break up the monotony. Sometimes the game will make a pitiful effort to introduce something new, such as a ballista or catapult. By the way, the crosshair on the ballista isn't even a real crosshair, it's just an object tethered in front. Story missions usually come in one of three flavours. Defeat an enemy captain or captains, defend a point until the enemy commander appears and defeat them, or escort an ally to a certain point, then defeat the enemy captain guarding that point. Some battles have certain conditions to them, mostly revolving around not letting an allied commander die, but there's really not much variety. Almost every objective in the game revolves around defeating an enemy captain, to the point where I started to wonder if that's the only way Omega Force can trigger the next event. 
And if the victory condition involves defeating an enemy commander, then you can often just beeline it straight to them, obliterate them, and win the battle. Everyone around you just stops in the tracks, and you have to wait until the voice lines play out. It looks ridiculous. Chun, how could you? I always treated you so well. Never do I want to do something like this again. Can anybody provide me with a decent challenge? And yet despite that, despite my constant whining, I still like it. Purely because of how entertaining the story is. I did the first two campaigns on normal difficulty, then the next two on easy because I was beyond the point of caring about gameplay. I ended up just waltzing around doing the bare minimum to get through each mission, just to soak up more cutscenes with these lovable rascals, and that same indifference towards the gameplay continued all the way to the end. That was... until... Forget everything I said about the gameplay! I was wrong! What I didn't understand at the beginning is that although I came for the story mode, I stayed for conquest mode. That's because, although story mode is quite a lengthy endeavour, there were so many gameplay elements that you don't even get to experience until you're let loose in conquest mode. Conquest mode is pretty self-explanatory. Look at this map. See all the grey tiles? You want them to be gold tiles, and each tile represents a battle, or in the case of legendary ones, a few battles. So what does this very simple concept do to change my opinion on the gameplay? First of all, you have the ability to freely choose any of the named characters in the game, including characters not playable in the story. So if you get bored of a character, you're not locked into them. Secondly, each battle comes with a battle rating, so you can get a better idea of how challenging they're supposed to be, and you're able to adjust the difficulty whenever you want. You have no idea how game-changing that second point is. During the story mode, if they wanted to make it more difficult, they would just add more cavalry, more archers, more ballistae, etc. It just felt like a very cheap way to increase the challenge. But by giving you more control and information to make a decision, you can adjust the challenge without being confined to one difficulty level. Throughout the mode you can make allies and hire bodyguards to step in from time to time. You can also purchase or earn guardian animals. So if I go into a challenging battle knowing that Tao Tao and Xiao Ho Dun will both team up with me, while also owning a falcon who can stun lock my enemies into submission, then you'd better believe I'm going to try it out on a harder difficulty. It's not just conquering tiles though. Playing legendary battles will cause characters to travel from town to town. Visiting them in towns you've captured, along with fighting alongside them, can increase your bond. Once the bond becomes strong enough, you can recruit them to be your bodyguard. Other visitors to your towns include the merchant, whom you can buy weapons and exotic animals from, and the scholar, who quizzes you on Three Kingdoms lore. These extra modes also come with a ton of voice acting. I really wasn't expecting it to be so good. I've got my reputation to live up to. No way I'm letting my daughter beat me. I get to fight my father. This is going to be exciting. Conquest mode is also entirely cooperative with a friend in split screen. So what is this? Yellow's done, white we can do. Oh, that's China. Everything is better in co-op. Especially if your friend also happens to be an alien who doesn't mind using the numpad to play. If you're a console player, you're alright. Don't come to school tomorrow. But PC players, get ready to have your multiplayer experience severely dampened. When the game was ported to PC, they did the bare minimum. Though there is controller support, you'll only ever see keyboard prompts. Also, when pausing, only player 1 can use the pause menu. Meaning that if player 2 wants to upgrade their skills or change the weapons, they simply can't. In conclusion, make sure that your friend is very patient. Or an alien. And if you really want to wring this towel dry, Legends mode is like the B-side to the story mode. There's a metagame of trying to rebuild a castle town to its former glory, but there's not much in the way of decision making. The main attraction is fighting major battles from the other perspectives, battles from events not included in the story mode, and what-if scenarios. Like when Liu Bu went on a rampage and destroyed every faction leader in the game. I was impressed by the voice lines added into conquest mode, but Legends mode takes it even further. You have narration before missions explaining the context of the battle, an opportunity to walk around the camp and talk to people, and full cutscenes at the end of missions. They do a good job of fleshing out the minor characters who don't feature much in the story. If you don't mind the repetitive gameplay, you can get plenty of mileage out of this game. But if you don't care about the setting and can't stand the gameplay, you are going to hate this. And I understand why. Omega Force have put such little effort into maintaining their audience. They put out what feels like hundreds of similar games, and there's no way I'm going to play them all. Jesus, so many games. 
I only check into the series once every few entries because of how little things change. On the technical side, although the PC port is a lazy one, it's at least very stable. I had no crashes and only a handful of frame rate drops, so no real complaints there. The graphics aren't likely to wow anybody. They weren't even considered good back in 2011. In fact, the environments are quite ugly and empty, and way too big. And the constant pop-in is just horrendous. I could go on and on about everything I don't like in this game. The minimap covers half the screen sometimes, and when you play split screen you each have a map, even though they share the exact same information. And the dialogue covers up player 1's health bar! There are so many missions where you fight your way to one edge of the map, only to be told to fight your way back to the other end because enemies spawned right next to your commander. Speaking of which, this truly is 1 vs 1000 gameplay, because your allies are friggin useless. They don't pull enemies away from you or contribute in any meaningful way, they're just kinda there sometimes. So why do I like this game so much? Well, if you're a fan of the time period, options are very limited. And like a sad, lonely housewife, I always return to my abuser. How I wish that another studio would do the source material justice. How I wish that the XXX and the YYY and the XX and the YY wasn't the only way to win. And how I wish that Omega Force's laziness and Koei Tecmo's greed wasn't constantly rewarded by suckers like me. Thank you for joining me on this journey. I really appreciate it. See you next time. My lord, what are... <laughs> Everyone! Let us enjoy this! <laughs>